coincidences often leave one questioning the very fabric of reality. These strange twists of fate can occur when the mundane and extraordinary collide. Number 10. For ages, people may have wondered and asked themselves why the moon is exactly the same apparent size from Earth as the sun. Many did not want to leave it up to happenstance, but it appears that it's just that. It's merely a happy coincidence. The sun and the moon are the same angular size in the sky because the sun is 400 times wider than the moon and is also 400 times further away. Since the first observations of the total eclipse, people have wondered how lucky they are to be able to get such a perfect alignment. An astrophysicist, Grant Tremblay, was able to provide the answer. He confirmed that it was indeed a lucky coincidence and that there was no significance to the distance or the sizes. The moon is 239,000 miles away from the Earth, and the sun, all 865,000 miles of it, is roughly 400 times further away from the moon, which means it's 93 million miles away from Earth. It's here that the cosmic coincidence lies, as so said by Tremblay. Since the sun is 400 times larger and 400 times further away, they appear to be the exact same size in the sky. When those chance alignments occur, such as the total solar eclipse, the disk of the moon completely blocks out the disk of the sun. Furthermore, Earth seems to be in just the perfect place for eclipse observation, as it resides in the Goldilocks zone. This zone refers to the habitable area around a star, where it's not too hot nor too cold for liquid to exist on the surface of a planet. Paired with being in just the right region, there's also the right gravity and mix of the correct elements for life to develop and evolve sentience. It's an incredibly miraculous coincidence that the moon would fit so perfectly to block out the sun, given that there's no physical reason for this to be the case. While the alignment of the celestial objects, such as the Earth, Sun, and Moon, is a normal occurrence within the solar system, its creation of eclipses on Earth is a unique feature. Other planets also experience alignment with the Sun, but none of them have the added coincidence of the size and distance. It's all thanks to a strange yet wonderful co-occurrence between size and distance that we're able to view something as spectacular as an eclipse. Number 9. Coincidentally, three major earthquakes have struck Mexico on the same day in different years. The first had been on the 19th of September in 1985, then again in 2017, and finally 2022. The last two had come within an hour after the earthquake drill that was conducted every 19th of September in commemoration of the devastating 1985 incident. On the morning of the first major earthquake, the magnitude was 8.0, which devastated central, southern, and western parts of the country. The 2017 earthquake had measured a magnitude of 7.1, with less fatalities. The 2022 event had left houses, schools, and health clinics severely damaged. At least 200 buildings sustained some disfigurement and reached a level 7.4 on the Richter scale. Jorge Ornelas, a call center coordinator, had said that if citizens keep thinking that this is going to happen every 19th of September, then it's going to keep on happening. A researcher in seismology explained that there's no physical coincidence for these earthquakes occurring on one day in different years. There are five tectonic plates under Mexican territory, the North America, the Pacific, the Riviera, the Caribbean, and the Cocos. The 1985 occurrence was the result of an interaction between the Cocos Plate and the North American Plate. A United States Geological Survey seismologist, Paul Earle, had confirmed that there's no reason that earthquakes would be biased in any given month. This coincidence has led to a rise in anxiety. Upon the 2022 incident, a local resident of the local Roma neighborhood, Isa Montes, had stated that it seemed like a curse, saying, quote, there's something about the 19th. The 19th is a day to be feared, she said. This time, the earthquake had been so strong that a tsunami warning was issued afterward to the coastal areas. While there's no physical reason for the earthquakes to choose this specific day to strike, Mexico is one of the most active seismic areas in the world and is positioned upon the three largest tectonic plates. The probability of these natural disasters occurring on the same day in different years had a likelihood of 0.000751% and 0.000024%. 
In order to calculate such a probability score, various assumptions were made. Since earthquakes are random, they're just as likely to strike on one day as another. They're separate, independent events, and each year, an earthquake that measures a magnitude of seven or more hits Mexico City. Using such an assumption, the physicist at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, Jose Luis Mateos, had calculated 1 in 365 by 1 in 365, giving him 133,335, or 0 0.000751%. He explained that it was an incredibly low probability, but mathematician Luis Gonzalez argued that the chances of three earthquakes occurring on the same date in Mexico were significantly lower. He had taken into account that 60 earthquakes had occurred, measuring seven or more in the last 120 years. He divided the number of earthquakes by the number of days between 1900 and 2022. He concluded that the chance of an earthquake with a magnitude of seven or higher striking on any day during that period was 0.13386%. According to such calculations, the likelihood of it happening three times on the same date was 0.0000000024%. The National Seismological Service has stated that the coincidence of the dates of the occurrences has opened new lines for scientific research. New questions require answers, but there's currently no scientific reason as to why these events would occur this way. Number 8. In an unlikely coincidence, a misinterpreted anagram ended up predicting that Mars has two moons. It was the morning of the 25th of July in 1610 when Galileo Galilei, the natural philosopher, astronomer, and mathematician, had pointed his telescope at Saturn and found that the planet appeared to be flanked by round bumps or bloops on either side. But the telescope was not advanced enough to pick up exactly what he had seen. This observation is now being credited as being the earliest description of the rings of Saturn in the history of astronomy. He knew that he'd witnessed something special and wanted to tell others about it. He wanted to announce it and secure credit for his discovery. Galileo would go on to send letters to his friends that were far from straightforward. They were encrypted anagrams, jumbled letters, which when correctly arranged, spelled out the Latin sentence, I have observed that the highest planet is threefold. At this time, the highest planet was considered to be Saturn. Galileo had been unaware that he discovered the planet's rings and therefore described that it was somehow divided into three parts. Announcing his discovery in the form of an encryption may have bought the astronomer more time to continue observations, but such inscriptions are subject to easy misinterpretation. One of the individuals to whom Galileo had sent the letter was a German scientist, Johannes Kepler, who was also an astronomer and had discovered three major laws of planetary motion. He had also followed and was in support of his friend's work. So when the coded letter found its way to his home, he immediately set to work to solve it. But he'd gotten it entirely wrong. Kepler had rearranged the letters to form the Latin sentence, be greeted, double knob, children of Mars. The solution was clearly erroneous, but he believed that he'd solved the riddle correctly, and the discovery had proven a theory that he for months had been contemplating. In 1610, Galileo had also found the four moons of Jupiter. This announcement had led Kepler to assume that the Earth has one moon, and Jupiter, which was two places out of Earth, had four. Sitting between the two is Mars, which he theorized to have two moons, maintaining the balanced celestial sequence. Along with the misinterpreted anagram and the incorrect assumption by Galileo that Jupiter only had four moons, the astronomer had deduced that Mars had two moons, which was entirely correct. This theory, though, would only be proven long after his passing. The two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos, would go undiscovered until 1877 by Asaph Hall, the American astronomer. The incorrect anagram had coincidentally predicted one of the largest astronomical discoveries of the 19th century, almost 300 years before it happened. And this was not the only time he had done this either, according to legend. Stories emerged that Galileo had sent him a second message, which he discovered that the planet Venus had phases and did not emit light itself, but shone due to the reflection of the sun. The message read, the mother of love copies the forms of Cynthia. The mother of love was an epithet for Venus, and Synthes referenced the moon. Kepler had misinterpreted this encryption, 
as there's a red spot in Jupiter which rotates mathematically. By mere coincidence, Kepler had mistakenly predicted the discovery of the great red spot of Jupiter more than two centuries before it had been officially discovered. Number 7. Robert E. Lee was a Confederate general who operated during the American Civil War. He would later be appointed the overall commander and had led the Army of Northern Virginia, the Confederacy's most powerful army, until its surrender in 1865. It was also Lee that issued the Special Order 191, later known as the Lost Order, before the Battle of Antietam. This order dictated the entire strategy of the army in a massive operation. General Lee had detailed the routes of which his army was to take upon the invasion of Harper's Ferry. The crucial aspect was that the army would be divided during an early part of the attack and would later regroup. Lieutenant General Thomas Jackson was to lead the group and capture the Harper's Ferry, while Major General Daniel Harvey Hill was to guard the rear. Eight copies of said strategy were produced by Lieutenant Colonel Robert H. Chilton, the Assistant Adjutant General. These copies were made three miles south of Frederick, Maryland, and were transcribed before being sent to each of the generals involved, as well as to President Jefferson via courier. One of these copies would become lost and discovered by Union troops four days after the delivery was set. It had been discovered in a farm a half mile north of Lee's camp, wrapped around three cigars that were lying in the grass in the recently vacated campground of which General had commanded. There are three likely candidates for who lost this copy. Chilton had undoubtedly written the copy that was found by the opposing army, and Hill had received his copy, but it was in Jackson's handwriting. For the rest of his life, Hill would maintain that he would never receive the one copy as written by Jackson, but not the one that had been written by Chilton, which is the lost order. No one knows exactly who lost the order, but it was either Chilton's courier, a member of Hill's staff, Kid Douglas, a young lieutenant, or possibly Hill himself. This mistake inevitably led to the opposing forces to find the strategy plan and be prepared for what was to come. The discovery of the order had determined the result of the Maryland campaign. Should the copy not have been lost, there's a slight chance that the South would have succeeded. It was on the morning of the 13th of September when Sergeant John Bloss and Corporal Barton W. Mitchell had discovered the wrapped up envelope. It was addressed to Confederate General D.H. Hill and its title read Special Order No. 191, Headquarters, Army of Northern Virginia. Upon realizing what they had just discovered, the operation plan would be passed up the chain of command. By chance, Samuel Pittman, the adjutant general, had recognized the handwriting on the paper. It was the colleague from the pre-war army, Robert Chilton. Pittman had taken the order to the Union commander, McClellan, who'd spent the previous week mystified by the operation carried out by Lee. Suddenly, the Confederate plan had become clear. He now knew that the army was going to split into five parts and be placed over a 30-mile stretch. Eight miles separated each section of Lee's army, with McLennan, 12 miles from the closest Confederate unit, stationed at South Mountain. The opposition was given an advantage, but the opportunity was squandered by McClellan's caution, as he believed that Lee had more troops than they actually had. He was also too slow with his response to the Lost Order and had taken 18 hours to put his army in motion towards Turner's Gap and Crampton's Gap. The Confederate general had been warned of the approaching Federal and sent more troops to block the gaps, which bought him time, allowing him to gather the units that had been scattered about. While it had not been a complete victory, the Union had the momentum shifted onto them during the Battle of Antietam, forcing the Confederate army to withdraw. Number 6. Abraham Lincoln's oldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, is the subject of a few conspiracies. One such event occurred not long before the assassination of the president. The Cleveland Morning Leader News had covered the story in April of 1865. It detailed that Edwin Booth, the brother of John Wilkes Booth, who ended up assassinating Lincoln, had been on his way to Richmond, Virginia, along with John T. Ford, the owner of Ford's Theater, to fulfill an engagement and once he was at the station, there would be a scramble to reach the cars. Edwin had been overtaken by another, who was being pushed by other boarders, forcing him to lose his footing when stepping on the platform. Had it not been for Edwin grabbing the man's coat, he would have fallen under the wheels of the train, and he was thankful to his savior. The man was Robert, whom Edwin had not recognized at the time. 
The son of the president, though, recognized him as he was a revered stage actor at the time. According to the Century magazine, he exclaimed, that was a narrow escape, Mr. Booth, and would later write that if it had not been for Edwin, he would have likely been seriously injured, if not something worse. According to another source, Robert had been on vacation from Harvard University. He'd been traveling from New York to Washington and found himself at the very train station as his father's assassin's brother. There's no evidence to suggest that the son had ever told his parents of the incident likely due to their worries after the passing of Willie Lincoln. That same month, the rescuer's brother, John Wilkes, would go on to assassinate Robert's father, Abraham Lincoln. Edwin had only later learned the identity of the man he'd saved in the train station, after Adam Badu, a colonel in the army, had written to him, congratulating him for saving the son of the president. The rescuer had been forced into temporary retirement following the assassination of the president, as so carried out by his very own brother, but would return to his career in 1866, where he would go on to open his own theater in New York called Booth's Theater. The theater was located on the corner of 23rd Street and 5th Avenue. It had been organized by a company that was known for producing Shakespearean plays. After becoming bankrupt, he would lose his theater in 1874, but quickly rebounded, aiding in the formation of the Players Club, a gathering for actors and eminent men. Each account of what occurred on that evening of the rescue varies, but Robert had written a letter detailing the real story. He explained that late one evening, passengers had been purchasing their car places. Between each car at the platform, there was a narrow space and everyone was waiting to board. The train had begun to move, causing a panic, which ultimately caused Edwin to lose footing, but quickly regained balance, only to see a well-dressed man about to fall between the train and the platform. Robert felt that his collar had been vigorously seized and was pulled back to the platform. He recounted in his letter that he turned to thank the rescuer, only to find that he was a famous actor. This was also not the only strange coincidence associated with Robert or with the assassination. He's been at the scene of not one, but three different presidential terminations. The two men had never corresponded about what had occurred at the train station, but neither of them had forgotten about it either. Edwin had often mentioned the occurrence to his friends who would go on to write about such an incredible incident. Robert had also spoken of it and wrote of the happening numerous times, including in his 1918 letter to Benedict, where he stated that he never met Booth again personally, but has always been grateful for his prompt action. Number 5. Royce Burton, a history teacher at a New Jersey university, had been in the process of educating his class when he began to tell them of a frightening event that occurred when he was a bit younger. In 1940, he'd been a Texas Ranger patrolling the Rio Grande or Rio Grande when he found himself lost in a canyon one evening. He attempted to climb out but lost his balance when he neared the top. Joe, one of his fellow rangers, appeared and grabbed onto his rifle strap to pull him to safety. Burton had expressed his gratitude, but the two would later lose contact when they enlisted in the Second World War. Coincidentally, as the teacher was nearing the end of his story, an elderly man appeared in the doorway, and it was Joe. He'd spent his time trying to locate the man he'd saved, and had happened to walk in just as he was telling the story. Twenty-five years after they'd last seen one another, Burton went on to let the fellow ranger finish the story. The university students sat astonished after witnessing the men's reunion. This sort of coincidence is known as synchronicity, a term coined by Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist and mystic. Synchronicity refers to an occurrence that happens with no apparent cause and affection relation, but is connected by meaning. James Hollis, an analyst and author, explained that everyone has experiences such as these. Hollis also knew Burton and mentioned his story in a book titled Hauntings, Dispelling the Ghosts Who Run Our Lives. He explained that we live in a haunted world where the invisible energy is always at work. Burton and Joe's story was an incredible coincidence, but synchronicity describes it perfectly. While it had been said that Joe had spent the last 25 years trying to track the man down, walking into the classroom at the exact moment that the person he saved was telling the story was a one in a million coincidence. This occurrence was meaningful, as are most coincidences, as so described by Bernard Bateman, a psychiatrist who detailed such events in a book called Meaningful Coincidences, How and Why Synchronicity and Serendipity Happen. This amazing coincidence, of course, brought about skeptics, as did the idea of synchronicity, 
but for the individuals who experienced it, it was magical and mind-boggling. Number 4. Frank Morgan is well known for the five different roles he played in the 1939 film version of The Wizard of Oz in The Emerald City. He'd been the cabbie who drove the horse of a different color. He was a guard entrance at the palace as well as the doorkeeper, the wizard himself, and had played Professor Marvel in the Kansas sequence. The makeup and costume designs that were used in the film had gone through various changes and revisions before and even during it. Before the filming had begun, the actor would go for various test shots, one of which occurred on the 17th of November in 1938. This was a test for Professor Marvel's makeup, and six days later he would do the same thing again, this time with a different jacket, tie, and hairstyle. That very jacket is the subject of a coincidence. It was said that the coat had been selected from a second-hand shop as something more tattered was needed for the character's portrayal. It was alleged that the very coat had once been owned by L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz. It seemed that fate had it that the jacket be used in the very film that its author had written. Initially, the story was thought to be a fib, as told by press agents who wanted their story in print, but the event would be featured and affirmed in the book The Making of the Wizard of Oz. The story had also been vouched for by the cinematographer Hal Rawson, his niece Haleen Bowman, and Mary Mayer, the unit publicist. It was Mary who explained that they wanted a decent-looking coat that was tattered, and so the wardrobe department would go looking for such a coat at a second-hand store on Main Street. It was not just one coat they bought, but a whole rack full. Morgan and the wardrobe man stood together to pick one. The chosen coat was a black broadcloth with a velvet collar. Bowman commented that it was ratty with age and had a green look to it. The coat was a perfect fit for the actor and had just the right amount of shabbiness. One afternoon, he turned out one of the pockets, and inside was the name L. Frank Baum. Mayer exclaimed that she made contact with a tailor in Chicago and sent him images. He in turn responded with a letter stating that the coat had been tailored for Frank Baum. The author's widow had further identified it as belonging to her late husband. It seems more likely than not that the jacket would turn up in a secondhand clothes store near MGM, the media company responsible for the film, since Baum had resided here for most of his life in Hollywood. Despite the accounts as detailed by the publicists, Many remained skeptical of the story and questioned its authenticity. One question that plagued the minds of the skeptics was why the actor would turn the pocket out in the first place. During the late 1930s, filming in Hollywood and California had become popular. The weather was fairly consistent throughout the year, but in such hot climates, the sound stages would often become overheated with the inclusion of large lights. It was only possible to film for up to 20 minutes at a time before shutting everything down to allow a cool down. Along with this climate came a problem that the actor faced. He was perspiring. By the time they'd wrapped up each day, he would be soaked and would take said jacket off and turn its pockets out to allow them to dry. It was during one such take on a hot afternoon that he had done this, revealing a sewn-in name tag. The cast and crew were silent. Number 3 Back in 2012, a bizarre and coincidental discovery had been made. 42 out of 43 United States presidents are all somehow related to King John of England, who'd signed the Magna Carta in 1215. The exception was the 8th president, Martin Van Buren, and possibly Dwight Eisenhower, the 34th president. All other U.S. presidents appeared to be distant cousins, and each of them had the trait of wanting power. It only took 500,000 names in order to connect all these individuals. It began with the first U.S. President, George Washington. Both the female and male family lines have been traced back in order to connect him to King John. He's the descendant of John Washington, who'd immigrated from Soulgrave, England. John Adams came from Henry Adams, who'd immigrated from Braintree, England. Thomas Jefferson is the great-great-grandson of Samuel Jefferson. James Madison is related to Isaac Madison, who also came from England. Patrick Andrew Monroe of Scotland is the great-great-grandfather of 5th U.S. President James Monroe. Henry Adams from Braintree, England is the ancestor of John Quincy Adams, the 6th President, and also the ninth great-grandfather of Calvin Coolidge, the 30th U.S. President. An immigrant from England was Andrew Jackson Sr., and his descendant was the 7th U.S. President Andrew Jackson. The 8th president, Martin Van Buren, had Dutch roots, excluding him from the party. 
William Henry Harrison is a relative of Benjamin Harrison who came from England. The 10th president, John Tyler, had links to England through Henry Tyler. James K. Pohl was the descendant of another immigrant from Lifford, Ireland, as was Zachary Taylor, the 12th U.S. president. Millard Fillmore came from John Fillmore Sr. of England, and Franklin Pierce was the descendant of Thomas Pierce from Norwich. James Buchanan was the resultant from James Buchanan Sr. of Ramelton. The 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, had been a grandson of Samuel Lincoln from England. Andrew Johnson has English, Scot-Irish, and Irish ancestry. The descendant of Matthew Grant from England was the 18th president, Ulysses S. Grant. Rutherford B. Hayes came from the England migrant, George Hayes. Edward Garfield relocated from England where the 20th U.S. president resulted, James A. Garfield. The list continues all the way through to Barack Obama, who is the 25th great-grandson of King John. Each generation that one goes back, the set of grandparents doubles. Going back 20 generations results in 40 great-grandparents and many cousins, which makes the entire ordeal seem a lot more likely. Every one of the U.S. presidents has ancestors that had come from the British Isles, which makes them each quite distantly related. All of them are also the descendants of Alfred the Great and William the Conqueror. King John had lived during the 12th century and went on to have five legitimate children and a dozen illegitimate. In a matter of just a few generations, he would have thousands of direct descendants, which would continue to increase over the centuries and connect most of the people in Britain to him. Given that most of the United States presidents have great-great-grandparents who had immigrated from England, making it more likely for them to be somewhat related, and coincidentally, they all became presidents. Number 2 on the 18th of May in 1804, the French Senate went to proclaim Napoleon I as the Bonaparte Emperor. It was a few years prior to this that the French had flown the first manned hot air balloon as well as the first hydrogen balloons. The public had been enchanted by these inventions, and they began to appear in designs on dinnerware, wall hangings, and chandeliers. The mania pressed on right through the French Revolution. Upon the very first flight, Ben Franklin had come to the suggestion that these creations may be carrying invading armies. On the 2nd of June in 1794, the army had sent one balloon several hundred feet up on a tether for the purpose of locating enemy artillery. Initially, the enemy had regarded this as a breach in the etiquette of war, but they soon modified their artillery in order to bring such balloons down. Hot air balloons became a dangerous yet glamorous addition but it was short-lived. When Napoleon came into power, he brought with him an old war conservatism regarding war and how it's conducted. He'd been the one to authorize a small balloon factory and had taken one with him on an ill-fated campaign to Egypt. After taking control of France through a coup, he shut down the balloon school and decided to conduct more conventional warfare. It was thereafter that a strange and coincidental thing had taken place. In 1804, upon his crowning, he hired a French balloon pioneer named André Garnerin. Garnerin was tasked with building a large but unmanned balloon for the crowning of it. It had been decorated with a large crown of blazing lights. It was released and took a journey to Rome without guidance before landing on Lake Bracciano just two days later. But it didn't land until the crown had been snagged on the tomb of Nero. It had broken off and Napoleon's crown was gracefully placed upon one of the worst ever emperors in the history of the world. Napoleon, of course, was not amused and subsequently fired Garnerin. He viewed the event as a bad omen and would prohibit the use of a military balloon. It was only six years later that they would reappear and find their place in the war again. Nero had been the fifth Roman emperor and had been the last of its first dynasty. He's notorious for his cruelty and had ruled in a time of great political and social change. During the first five years of his reign, he had good advisors and would even let injured civilians stay in his palace. He'd only taken an interest in his art and not in ruling the empire. But during his time in power, he would prosecute individuals such as St. Peter and St. Paul. Historians have also alleged that he'd eliminated not only his mother, but two of his wives as well. It would also be said that he'd intentionally eradicated an area to make a place for his luxurious palace. A chain that was found in Anglesey had bore witness to a culture of horrendous exploitation. While many stories of Nero's reign are the subject of propaganda, it was certainly enough for Napoleon to see the coincidence as a bad omen, 
which caused him to banish the use of hot air balloons in war and even fire the man who'd created the one he unleashed during his crowning. Number 1. Calculus refers to a branch in mathematics that deals with rates of change, and it appears that it was bound to be invented. Two individuals who'd not known one another had created it simultaneously. If one had failed to invent this branch of mathematics, it would still exist today. The coincidence is referred to as the Leibniz-Newton controversy. This is because back in the 1660s, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz had both independently created calculus. The phenomenon is also known as multiple discovery, which seems to have happened often enough for it to be named. In 1666, Newton had described his differential calculus and the method of fluxions in a written paper, which was not published until decades later. Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy had been published in 1687, which had included theories relating to motion and gravitation, which made use of calculus to formulate. But his method of fluxions did not appear in print until 1693. This had been after Leibniz had published his first calculus paper in 1684 and alleged that he discovered it in the 1670s. An English mathematician named John Wallace, however, made a rather controversial statement in 1695, where he suggested that Leibniz had learned calculus through Newton. This claim would later be proven false. In response to this offensive assumption, Leibniz argued that certain mathematical problems could only be solved by his version, which in turn caused another mathematician, Fatio de Dulier, in 1699 to accuse him of plagiarism. In 1712, the Royal Society had written a report purporting a settlement of the matter, but the whole investigation had been directed by Newton himself. The results stated that Leibniz had concealed knowledge of the work as carried out by Newton, a result that has now been proven false. Leibniz, in turn, then accused him of stealing his work and making errors in its application. This back-and-forth dispute would continue up until the 1716 passing of the mathematician. Both of them had been responsible for mathematical discoveries, and who would come up with calculus would remain controversial. As previously mentioned, this sort of coincidence has a name, multiple discovery. This phenomenon essentially is a hypothesis, stating that most scientific breakthroughs are made independently and simultaneously by different researchers. Test cases have included the invention of calculus by Newton and Leibniz along with other cases including the invention of the telephone by Alexander Graham Bell and Elisha Gray, the theory of natural selection as developed by both Charles Darwin as well as Arthur Russell Wallace. The hypothesis is a concept of evolution, of scientific thinking as a social development, which has highlighted how scientific advances have stemmed from original insight and have resulted in social processes. The mathematics that made calculus possible had already existed in Newton's day, so if he ever wrote down his ideas, the discovery would have still occurred. Similar occurrences have also led researchers to believe that one important discovery makes the closely related discoveries possible. Society is full of a sufficient number of researchers, and scientific advances will continue to be made quickly, more often than not, by multiple different people. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.